I want to add my welcome to uh, those that, that came before me, uh, and I want to say that I was really impressed with the energy and enthusiasm that I saw last night, and with the, you know, the leadership and the zeal that people like Bill and Linda bring to this organization. I think this, as a rare disease, has so much more that uh, is backing it in terms of patients, children, and, and uh, parents than many other rare diseases that um, unfortunately fall into the same sort of pitfalls that every rare disease falls into, which is the difficulty we have in making a diagnosis and making a diagnosis early and with um, finding appropriate therapies because um, rare diseases are often diseases and, and like all orphans have no one really who's interested in trying to find a solution because it may not necessarily be economically uh, lucrative. Uh, but I, I do want to say that I'm really impressed with this, uh, with this enthusiasm, and I welcome you to Iowa. We've got a perfect day for you. And um, what I want to also tell you is that um, um, I'm an adult nephrologist, and there are adults with this disease as well. And in fact, my role in, uh, at the University of Iowa is primarily to take care of adults uh, with the disease. Um, and they, um, if you will, um, have uh, our, our mothers, uh, not necessarily uh, children. And they also um, have some of the same challenges and complexities uh, that this disease offers them. I want to say that it's been a privilege to, to be here and to be part of a, of, a, of a solution for this difficult disease. It really is a team effort. Um, I'm the face that many patients see, but really there's a lot of back and forth that goes on. Um, even though I'm an adult nephrologist, um, a lot of what we do here is after discussion with people like Richard and uh, Carla Nestor, and, and there's a lot of back and forth that goes on, and it really, really is a uh, team effort. Um, I also um, want to tell you that um, I um, am on service, so I have patients to see after this talk, and I won't be staying till the end, but I will try and come back for the panel discussion. Um, and um, I will try and limit the medical speak. If, if, if you feel that I'm using a term that you're not comfortable with, just raise your hand. I know that you know all about this disease. And in fact, one of um, the best parts of this, this disease is that our patients actually remind us that that's not something you really know. Um, or the, here is what I read that, that you actually haven't heard about yet. So you probably know all these terms if you don't just raise your hand. So uh, my um, uh, uh, charge from Richard and Bill is to talk about treatment options for atypical HUS. I have, I think, 30 minutes. And so I'm going to cover two specific treatment options, and that's uh, plasma therapy and eculizumab. Most of you know this as Soliris, but I'm going to keep using the term eculizumab. And I'm going to try and cover um, management of end-stage kidney disease because I feel that's what I know best, and that probably is uh, the more common devastating end-organ damage that we see with atypical HUS. And it's probably the, the one end-organ damage that we have the most experience with in terms of management options. Um, so I want to cover three things in terms of management of uh, end-stage renal failure, uh, which is kidney transplant with standard therapy, kidney transplant with eculizumab, and briefly the role of a liver kidney transplant. I want to tell you uh, again very briefly how eculizumab works, what it is, and try and answer the unknown, which is when should eculizumab be used. Um, so what is plasma therapy? Um, it's a broad term that includes plasma infusions and plasma phoresis. You will see terms for plasmapheresis like plasma exchange and apheresis. They are to some extent interchangeable, although when we use the term plasma exchange, we mean plasma is being taken out and plasma is being replaced. We can do plasmapheresis without actually replacing plasma, and that is technically not plasma exchange, just plasmapheresis. So plasma therapy is or was the first line therapy until just last year. Um, and that was based on expert opinion rather than uh, substantial data. So it wasn't driven by data, but it appeared in many of our experiences uh, anecdotally to have a substantial impact on uh, atypical HUS. And there are many in this audience who had countless hours getting plasma in one form or the other and have faced some of the challenges of plasma therapy. 
Um, and in plasma infusions, uh, we give fresh frozen plasma, uh, which contains clotting factors. So it's actually used in many other diseases too, where there are clotting factor deficiencies and risk of bleeding. Um, and it, re it also contains complement regulatory proteins, that entire cascade and all those proteins that are mutated in atypical HUS, uh, many of them are circulating in plasma and normal plasma contains that. Uh, and plasmapheresis is uh, removal of patient's plasma, and as I said, you can either replace it with fresh frozen plasma, or you can replace with another fluid, like albumin. In atypical HUS, we always want to replace with fresh frozen plasma, and that's what FFP is. So um, this can be used both for acute therapy and for maintenance. So acute therapy is to get you over the disease, and once you're over the disease, we call that in, in remission, and we try and maintain remission with one drug or another. Um, and if, if not, or even if you do, there is a risk the disease comes back, and we call that a relapse. Uh, and in uh, plasma infusion, the, role, the goal is to replace the missing complement factor. In plasmapheresis, we have several possible reasons to do it. One is to make space for that plasma infusion. It's a large volume of fluid that is administered, and patients who have certain, certain complications of atypical HUS, such as renal failure or heart failure, are not able to necessarily tolerate all of that volume. And so plasmapheresis allows us to make space, take out the plasma that you have and give you back some fresh plasma. The other is to specifically remove what's in the plasma that might be causing atypical HUS. So uh, Richard talked about deficiencies in proteins that uh, lead to atypical HUS, and he also talked about, and Carla did too, about situations where there are autoantibodies, antibodies that we make against ourselves that can destroy the, the complement regulatory proteins and cause atypical HUS. So plasmapheresis allows you to remove that inhibitory protein, like factor H um, antibody. It allows us to remove other proteins that might be mutated and that, if you will, are not inactive, but interfere with the function of normal proteins. So that also can be removed with plasmapheresis. And finally, just like plasma infusion, since the, you're, you're replacing what you remove with plasma, you're actually replacing the complement factor. Um, so what's the current standard of practice? And um, uh, currently, um, and this is as of two weeks ago, uh, it is plasma therapy. And we know from uh, case series um, and uh, published case reports that early intensive therapy with plasma can induce partial or complete remission. And remission here is defined by hemolysis parameters, hemolysis meaning the breakdown of red cells, uh, that uh, both Richard and Carla talked about, but this is not uh, the most effective form of therapy as many of you um, are, are uh, uh, witnesses to. Complement factor H, for example, there is uh, only about a 63% partial remission and only about 5% complete remission. For complement factor I, the number is even lower. And we don't have enough data on the other forms of atypical HUS, the other six or seven uh, proteins that when mutated cause atypical HUS. But we do know that if used uh, in, in, in some situations, it can prevent relapses and, and possibly progression to renal failure. Uh, it's useful for acute episodes, um, and there are uh, recommended doses, and this will be, um, I think, in your handout or in your videotaped uh, slides. Uh, most of what I have is written text for that reason. And there are recommended doses that we use for plasma infusion and for plasmapheresis. And um, you'd want to start apheresis or plasmapheresis as the preferred therapy as soon as possible after presentation. And the previous speakers talked about the confusion at the, at the start of the illness. And some of us, some of our patients have had very explo explosive onset of disease with the requirement for dialysis within days of presentation to, the, to a hospital with all sorts of, um, um, of uh, abnormalities in their blood and urine tests. And one is struggling to make an accurate diagnosis. And so sometimes you, you act on a clinical suspicion, a strong clinical suspicion, and you really want to try and get therapy in as soon as possible even if the disease, even if the diagnosis is not secure because end organ damage of one sort or another can sometimes be permanent, as some of you in the audience can attest to. 
And once you've got the disease under control, it's useful to maintain remission and prevent relapses. So it still has a role in the early stages of the disease until the diagnosis is uh, clarified. And what the data tells us is that you can start to space out those plasma infusions to every week, to every two weeks, to every four weeks, uh, and, then, and, and so on and so forth. And in some cases, patients have come off their plasma therapy either because the disease appears inactive or because the major organ that was trying to be preserved has, uh, has now been irreversibly lost. And so you can go for months or years without apparent uh, relapses, although the disease is possibly, in some cases, taking a toll on other organ systems because of continuous hemolysis and low platelet counts. Uh, we have some official recommendations from the European uh, study group. This is a little outdated now, and again, this uh, um, is, comes from several uh, publications that I've listed there. Um, and their recommendations are plasma exchange and plasma infusions for the management of the acute hemolysis. And the amount of infusions or apheresis you provide is what we think is necessary to either replace the missing protein or to remove a mutant uh, uh, protein. And obviously, if the antibodies are present, then you'd want to do plasmapheresis rather than plasma infusions. Um, so what are the criteria for empiric? And that's a medical speak for treatment without proof. And there's a lot of diseases where we have to use empiric therapy, in any common infections. If the, if, uh, the suspicion is, is strong enough, we might start a patient on an antibiotic without actually getting that proof, because sometimes delay can, can cost you. So what are the criteria for empiric uh, plasma therapy? And essentially, that is when to suspect atypical HUS rather than one of the other diseases that can mimic it. And these would be patients who, have, who present at a very young age where other diseases are less common where they appear to have an atypical course for typical HUS, where it's a very slow onset or an insidious onset, where the disease comes back. So classic HUS, for example, will come once, and it doesn't come back, uh, and it's usually in the setting of a diarrheal episode. So if it came back, that should make you think about atypical HUS. Um, if there's a family history, that means somebody else in the, in, the, in the family has had the same or a very similar disease, suggesting that there's a genetic basis to the disease. And if there's a genetic basis to the disease, it's more likely to be atypically HUS than one of the many other disorders that Dr. Nestor uh, showed you. And if HUS comes back after a kidney transplant, these are all of the situations where a physician um, uh, begins to think about atypical HUS. And these are all situations where without getting that final proof, starting plasma therapy is quite reasonable and quite effective. Um, so the challenges with plasma therapy, um, I don't need to tell those of you who've actually had it. Um, you can get allergic reactions or anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a deadly form of, uh, of allergy. It's a kind you see with, with people who have uh, peanut allergies or bee sting allergies where you can actually even die from it if you don't have the appropriate uh, medical expertise close by. You can have volume overload, that's medical speak, for too much fluid on you where you can actually become swollen, you can become short of breath, your blood pressure can go way up. Part of the um, issue with seizures and, and the um, brain disease we see in, in very advanced atypical HUS has to do with the amount of fluid they have on board and the degree of high blood pressure that they have, which is in turn driven by the damage they have to the blood vessels from the uh, disorder. Um, one of the other challenges is that you have to be in an infusion center or an apheresis center. It's not something you can actually have done at home. And if you need to have plasmapheresis, then you have to have some t form of long-term uh, device, a catheter, um, an AV fistula if you have kidney failure, or a port. Um, uh, and that comes with its own set of complications, infections, blood clots that can sometimes be fatal. So this is not an easy solution, and um, uh, it's not something that we do lightly. And that brings us to um, a solution to the hitherto accepted standard of care, uh, and that is Echolizumab, or Soliris, which was FDA approved, and you probably know more this uh, <laughs> in the back of your, uh, your hand. It's now in evaluation phase for a number of other diseases. So I think we've just um, touched the tip of the iceberg for the diseases for which Echolizumab will be useful. When it first came out, we predicted it will be useful for certain complement-mediated diseases. It's turned out to be useful for a different set of complement-mediated diseases. 
And in the kidney transplant field, um, there are other situations where we're beginning to use this drug. Um, we've uh, recently had a patient who had an ABO incompatible transplant. That is a patient who's um, had a, 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 a blood group kidney transplanted into uh, himself who was an O blood group recipient. And in that situation, you can get a violent um, antigen antibody reaction with death of the um, uh, kidney. And we were able to rescue that uh, very severe reaction with the use of eculizumab. There's uh, been a study that's just been published last month that is uh, showing us that eculizumab can be used in patients who have a lot of antibodies. And some of you who are waiting for, or your children who are waiting for a um, kidney transplant um, and are waiting for the right time to have it with Solaris, um, are probably facing a situation where because of the number of transfusions you've had that you may have antibodies in your system that provide its own challenge in having a kidney transplant over and above the challenge of having atypical HUS. And if eculizumab appears to have a role in reversing those severe um, uh, antibody reactions that we sometimes see in transplant patients, those with antibodies, those with APO incompatibility, then eclizumab, if you will, becomes a double bonus for us. And it, I suspect we're going to see increasing uses of this drug in not only the transplant field, but in some other diseases. And perhaps uh, Dr. Bedrosian will touch upon this when she talks about the clinical trials. So it's an orphan drug for an orphan disease. It's a uh, biologic, it's a humanized monoclonal antibody. What that essentially means is that antibody has been carefully engineered by Alexian to resemble a human protein. So it's as close to a human protein as possible. And the reason for that is so that we um, do not, if you will, mount um, a response to drive that antibody away. It's a foreign protein just like a protein that you might get with a viral infection. And we are geared to make antibodies against everything that's foreign, including antibodies that are given to us as forms of therapy. So by making it humanized, we're making it look as close to a human protein as possible, if you will, we are um, trying to um, fool our own immune system into thinking that's us and not them. And that, I think, will result in fewer and fewer of, of you getting the drug, developing antibodies against the drug that can make the drug, theoretically at least, ineffective or inactive. And it's directed against, as uh, Richard and, uh, um, and Carla showed, against a terminal complement protein called C5. So complement cascade is like, if you will, a, a tiny rock on an unstable rock face starting a landslide where you have various barriers along the way to prevent that landslide from getting out of control. And uh, towards the end of that landslide is this sort of gatekeeper protein called C5. And if you can block C5, whatever the cause for the upstream uh, landslide that began, whether it is C3 mutation, factor H mutation, factor I mutation, we appear to be able to stop the drug in its tracks. It's an expensive drug, but for those of us uh, and those of you who've had the disease, we know that when you compare the cost of uh, hospitalizations, plasma infusions, plasma phoresis, catheterizations, complications of catheter placement, uh, um, cost of dialysis, cost of uh, various medications to, to boost your hemoglobin that we have to use in patients who are on dialysis, it actually isn't that expensive. But when you actually look at the dollar cost of a single drug, it might appear to be that way. This is just a schematic to show you what you already know, and that is that, if I can get my mouse to work, maybe it won't, to show you that eclizumab works down here, and that's the cascade as it comes down. Um, I'm going to show you just one published report. This was the first uh, published report of eclizumab use, uh, and this was in a patient who had kidney failure at the age of 25 turned out to be from a factor H mutation. This is often made after the fact, but it's sort of published as a story. Uh, who got the first kidney transplant at the age of 30, that's after five years of dialysis, uh, with uh, recurrent disease, that is the disease atypical HUS came back within five weeks with loss of the graft. We call the graft essentially is that foreign organ that we have transplanted. In the case of a kidney transplant, the graft is a kidney uh, uh, allograft. And that occurred despite plasmapheresis. After another seven years of dialysis, that patient underwent a second transplant, and within six weeks, the disease was back and was not responsive to plasmapheresis. And what I want you to pay attention on the next slide are the laboratory parameters that uh, are indicative of the disease, 
uh, that you probably are very familiar with. So there will be a falling hemoglobin or a hematocrit, depending on how your doctor does these things, which, if it's hemolysis, will be associated with a rising LDH, a rising bilirubin, and a falling haptoglobin. And we don't have to do all of these tests all of the time. Just one or two of these in the right setting will be enough for us to track a disease. Falling platelet count and rising creatinine. So those are the three sort of cardinal features of, of HUS, uh, hemolysis, uh, low platelet count or thrombocytopenia, and a rising creatinine. And uh, when those things happen, the disease is progressing. When those things reverse, the disease uh, is being stopped in its tracks. So here, if you will, is what that looks like. And I wish I had a pointer. Maybe I can use this. There we go. So it's a little bit of a busy slide, but on this axis is the platelet count. And so you want to be higher on this axis. On this axis is the creatinine, and you want to be lower on that axis. And at the bottom of that same axis is haptoglobin, and you want to be higher on that axis. So here is this patient now looking at the story six days before eculizumab or soliris, who has had a kidney transplant whose uh, in black is the creatinine whose creatinine from 1.2 is starting to go up. The diagnosis is made very early on, despite a very modest rise in creatinine, because in red is the platelet count that begins to fall from about 115,000 or so down to 75,000. So physicians very promptly made the diagnosis. They had a very high index of suspicion because this was the second transplant for that disease. And you can see that at that time, they also measured the haptoglobin, which was very low. So hemolysis low platelets, kidney failure, classic atypical HUS recurrence. Patient starts plasmapheresis, has four sessions, platelet counts continuing to fall, no change in haptoglobin, creatinine's continuing to rise. And that's when echolizumab is used. A single dose, is drug, a single dose of that drug is given, and you can see that very dramatic fall in creatinine and just as dramatic rise in platelet count and a gradual rise in haptoglobin back to the normal range. So it's an incredibly dramatic reversal of a disease that up until that point really had no other effective therapy except plasma. And you can see that plasma therapy is not always effective. Um, what do we know so far from the published studies? And I'm going to restrict my comments to only the published studies. Um, Dr. Bedrosian is going to cover the clinical trials that led to the approval, and she probably has a lot of information on on the unpublished studies and, and personal experiences than I do. But we, know, we do know from, from the published reports that there are 17 uh, um, uh, uh, situations where echolizumab has been used. And it's been used to treat atypical HUS in native kidneys and to prevent or treat post-transplant recurrence. Eight of these 17 were children, so you know, half adults, half children. Six of them had complement factor H, two have C3, one have uh, factor I, and others where mutation was, were not looked for or mutations weren't found, and it isn't necessarily clear from those published reports where they were. And then there is the multicenter prospective phase two trials, which Dr. Bedrosian is going to cover. So what do the published studies tell us? Well, they tell us that the relapse of atypical HUS is not predictable, but you knew that. Uh, we, we know that echolizumab is effective, and it, often in a very dramatic way, so dramatic that it doesn't take a genius to look at that, that picture and say, this drug works. So dramatic that you don't actually have to do statistics or, uh, or um, collect 100 cases to say that that drug works. And it's not very often that we come across a drug that has uh, effects like that. We do know that the response is not sustained. So in that first publication, they gave a single dose. The, 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 the disease appeared to go into remission for several weeks, but it came back. And we know that repeated dosing is necessary. And uh, it appears to be useful in more than one gene defect, not just in complement factor H, but in several other gene mutations. Is it going to be effective in every known mutation? We don't know, but I suspect the answer is yes if all of them are acting finally through C5 to lead to uh, a disease. And so far, as best as I can tell, there are no major side effects when you compare it to uh, what, uh, th what the disease did. And this is um, uh, the published adverse events that came from the pivotal study of echolizumab for the, for the disease for which it was approved, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And the side effects are really, to, in my mind, modest. 
Um, so what are the options for patients who have end-stage uh, kidney failure? Well, if you, um, the options are a kidney transplant, uh, which is likely to succeed without additional therapy if the mutation is in a protein called MCP, and that's because that defect is in the host kidney. It's not a circulating protein. So if it's in the host or the, or the person's kidney, and you replace it with a new kidney from a donor who doesn't have the mutation, you would predict that the disease will not come back. And so far, the evidence seems to be, uh, seems to be so. Um, on the other hand, if you have a mutation in any of the other known proteins that cause atypically HUS, they're all circulating proteins. And the kidney, if you will, is a bystander that, that took the brunt of that damage. And you put a new kidney in, you're in the same environment with that circulating protein. And so you're likely to get um, recurrent um, kidney failure. And there's a high risk of failure. And the risk of rec recurrence you can see is actually quite high, up to 80, 90 percent, depending on the type of mutation. We know the most about factor H and factor I because they're the more common mutations. But I suspect that we will find similar rates of recurrence for the other uh, mutations. And our own recommendation uh, for uh, end-stage renal failure is a kidney transplant with preemptive, meaning before the transplant, uh, perioperative, meaning uh, around the transplant, so that there is enough drug before, during, and after, and to provide the drug long term. Because we don't know yet who can have the drug for a shorter period of time. And uh, we feel safer until we have more evidence in using the drug for as long as we can. Um, if you um, uh, uh, have uh, a circulating protein defect, a kidney liver transplant is also an option. And the, the, the rationale is actually a very sound one. You replace the kidney because that's the, the organ that has failed uh, and you're on dialysis or you're getting very close to dialysis. And you replace the liver because it's the liver that is, if you will, making that mutated uh, protein that is altered in your genetic code. And so although the liver is ostensibly normal, in fact, it is really normal and doing 99.99% of all of its functions just fine, one protein that it's making is abnormal. So you can replace the liver so that it makes that new protein, even though your underlying genetic code um, is supposed to make a different protein, the genetic code in that new liver will, will make a normal protein that you're missing. So it's a potential benefit to patients who have CFH, uh, this factor H, factor I, factor B, and C3 deficiency because these proteins are made in the, level, in the liver. We don't know yet about some other uh, um, uh, um, mutations, uh, but it's possibly uh, going to be true for them, and it won't be necessary if you have an MCP mutation. Uh, the experience so far is there's been uh, 21 or, or more such transplants, um, uh, 19 for CFH, two for CFI, one for thrombomodulin, I think. Um, the outcomes are improving. I mean, I think uh, parents and physicians were very courageous to proceed with this form of therapy because it truly offers a, a genuine way to address a very devastating disease. And I think to, uh, we, because of the experience of those uh, pioneering physicians and those patients, are now at a stage where that option is available if we didn't have a drug that we could use effectively. And I think we've overcome some of those early technical challenges. And I think at the right centers, with a lot of technical expertise, this, this uh, is a procedure that I think now has a better outcome than, than it had in the past. But I think um, because of the ease with which we can use a drug and with, because of the, the, the fact that the complication rate for a kidney alone is much less than that for a kidney liver, and we do, we do kidney liver transplants for many other diseases as well, um, because the complication rate for a kidney alone is much less, um, it seems uh, um, to me quite reasonable that echolizumab and a, and a kidney alone is the standard of therapy for patients who have end-stage renal disease. So the outline uh, of treatment for this disease then would be to immunize against meningococcus two months prior to, to echolizumab. Um, and we uh, recommend a kidney transplant with a living donor, and that's because this is best done in a staged planned fashion, and that's generally because a, a living donor is better than a, a deceased donor kidney anyway. Um, and uh, at this point in time, what we're doing is preoperative um, uh, plasma exchange followed by echolizumab given in two doses. The first dose to make sure that we, we see the kind of response we want, and the second dose is given just prior to surgery. 
and then we give the drug uh, so far lifelong. The major issues with the drug, uh, no drug is completely benign, is a meningococcal infection. Um, vaccination prior to therapy uh, is now um, by the CDC recommended as two doses. Those recommendations just came out a few months ago. Um, the problem with the meningococcal vaccine is that it does not contain all the strains that are commonly seen in North America. It only covers you against some strains. The second problem with the meningococcal vaccine, as with all vaccines in patients who have poor kidney function, is that the immune response we mount to vaccination is not very good. And uh, some of our patients have actually not had an, any immune response to the vaccination. And we have been using long-term antibiotics even in those patients who've been vaccinated because we think that the, 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 the complication of a meningococcal infection is so severe uh, that we're willing to take the risk of the possible side effect of long-term antibiotic use. And that's what we've done. The French and the, and the, uh, the um, uh, British groups recommend long-term antibiotic prophylaxis in everybody regardless of vaccination. The other major issue is expense and insurance coverage. And up until the FDA uh, approval came, one of our big battles here was trying to get insurance approval. And we often had to go to first, second, and third appeals to get the insurance company to approve. The commonest reason for denial is that this is not FDA approved. And now that that has been taken care of, I suspect we will have an easier task, as will all of you in all of the centers that you might be going to. Um, unanswered questions that uh, Richard mentioned, I don't have to cover that again. Um, and so how do we approach patients with atypical HUS who are referred for a kidney transplant? Well, the first order of business is to do a thorough chart review. Many of you are coming with long records, and it takes some time to sort of go through it, figure out when tests were done, because sometimes a test result can change if they've been run after plasma infusion. And so we have to figure out what the disease is. We have to figure out the cause of the atypical HUS, uh, and those are some of the tests we do. We have to then consider the appropriate uh, transplant options. We try and avoid living-related donors for a kidney transplant because of the appropriate concern that that donor may have a mutation that puts him or her at risk. And as Richard said, said we only know about 56% of, uh, uh, of the time which gene is re responsible for atypical HUS. And we would rather not take the risk, especially if that living donor is young, because there's a long life for that donor yet to live. Um, so um, very briefly then, this is a long list, and it's now outdated, and I thank Carla for this uh, slide. This is a review of anti-complement therapeutics that are on the horizon, and that was in 2007. There's several drugs. Um, that's ekilizumab, um, and that's uh, one of several drugs that is, that is in Alexian's pipeline. I think um, we're going to find many uses for this drug, and we may find other drugs that work just as well, or that we can tailor better. Time will tell. Thank you.